You heard probably of some of this. There are a number of institutions that have been established at the European level in the third pillar. I hope you all know about the third pillar first. Third pillar in the European Union. There's increasing cooperation in police matters. That includes also intelligence matters, by the way. There's Europol, that I'm sure you've heard of. Eurojust, which is the judicial cooperation system. The Eurodac, which is in itself quite interesting as an example, I'll come to it in a minute. There's the Schengen Information System, which is, again is a very useful example of a particular development. I'll come to it. There's the third uh, uh, third pillar in the European Union. There's increasing cooperation in police matters. That includes also intelligence matters, by the way. There's Europol, that I'm sure you've heard of. Eurojust, which is the judicial cooperation system. The Eurodac, which is in itself quite interesting as an example, I'll come to it in a minute. There's the Schengen Information System, which is again is a very useful example of a particular development. I'll come to it. There's the uh, uh, criminal intelligence system and there's the, the recent preemptive. What's happening is that all of these were established for very defined purposes. Schengen in particular was established between a limited number of countries to compensate for the Netherlands in Germany and France to compensate for the abolition of the borders. Because we abolish the borders, we have to give our police forces uh, more information uh, on each other. It never had an operational role. Europe, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, uh, Europe will never have an operational role that's being proposed and is given. The Schengen Information System is being massively extended to something called SIS2, the Schengen Information System number 2. And it's going to be sharing a platform with the visa integration, uh, the visa data, that's data on people who want to enter the, the, the European Union. <coughs> the developments have been criticised, I have to jump a little bit through, on two particular bases. These ones. Policy laundering and function creep. Two nice terms. Both, I think, launched, uh, especially used by an organization called StateWatch. Excellent organization. www.statewatch.org. Very good. The best analysis of third pillar um, European stuff that you can produce. And much better than anything I can do, but I'm not really an EU EC lawyer. Policy laundering is a particular trick that governments use, increasingly use. That means that if there are particular policies that they know they will not be able to get to their own parliament, instead they root it in Europe, they discuss it in secret in the council, they come up with a proposal without any prior discussion, they then say this is the proposal that we have agreed, they all go back to their own parliament and if anybody objects they say sorry that's what we've agreed, you can't change it anymore. Take it or leave it. And since everybody wants to have European cooperation, most parliaments then say, oh, all right, we'll, we'll accept it. It is a denial of democratic accountability. It really is a serious flaw in the European setup. There are more in the third pillar, but this is one of the most important ones. Um, the House of Lords did a very good inquiry into the Schengen Information System, which I mentioned earlier, and mentioned it as one particular example in which this was used. Um, other measures and, and, and they came up with some very good proposals. What you have in, uh, in, in the United Kingdom, the government wants to introduce a law, it first has to issue a green paper, then a white paper, and then a draft, and then it gets discussed. The green paper is for general discussion, the white paper is for detailed discussion, and then you get the, the discussion in committee, and then you get the committee uh, in, on the floor of the House of Commons. You get an extensive debate on the pros and cons, and civil society can feed into these things. What happens at the European level is quite the opposite. There is no serious debate, civil society is not able to comment, the national parliaments are bypassed, and it is an absolute denial of the most basic principles of, of democratic lawmaking. And these serious matters that we've been talking about are all decided in that particular way. Yeah? Um, there is even a suggestion that issues on police cooperation with third states, particularly the United States, which is a big problem, should be moved to the second pillar when the European Parliament even would have le less uh, influence over it. This is, and it is a tendency by the governments to do this. And it is, to me, as a good European, one of the things that really undermines the, 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 the respect I have for the European institutions. The other thing is function creep. You set the system up. 
for a very limited purpose, and then you start adding purposes to it. Eurodeck is the best one. Eurodeck was set up to keep track of failed asylum seekers. It often happens, somebody comes into a country, applies for asylum, gets rejected as asylum, goes out of the country, gets back in somewhere else, and starts all over again. And the whole purpose was to identify those people and say, no, no, you've already been, been rejected. What, of course, is especially in the fight against terrorism, the new proposal, is to use all the Eurodeck data for, for criminal intelligence and, and criminal prosecution investigation purposes as well. The typical example of, of function creep. Um, and a third, you know, Shannon and Prune are good examples of it, is when a small group of states proposes a concept arrangement that they're happy with. They adopt that arrangement, Shannon, Prune. And then later on, other states are invited to join and urged by the Commission to join. And again, they are invited to join on a take it or leave it basis. Take it. As it is, you can't change the arrangement because they've already been agreed by these startup states, if you like. Again, it bypasses serious uh, political control at the European level. Now, the European Council, I said earlier, one of the fundamental principles that you have to have in police cooperation is data protection. There is a not ideal, but certainly in its principles, fairly decent EC directive on data protection. It sets a high level of data protection standards for all matters in the first pillar, all economic matters, right? including a high standard uh, for data protection on the exchange of data with third countries like the United States in particular, other non-European countries. One way of doing something <coughs> about all these problems that I'm talking about would be to have a similarly high level of data protection in the third pillar. Not only is that a good idea, it is a constitutional requirement. Data protection is in the EU Charter as a separate sui generis right, it's a separate right, it's not just a privacy right, but a right in its own protection. Because as I said, it's not just about invasion of privacy, but about who controls you through your data. And therefore it was proposed that the Council would come up with a framework decision on data protection in the third pillar. Well, they have, and it is lousy. It has been criticized by absolutely everybody who has any sense of data protection or of human rights. It has been criticized by the European Data Protection Supervisor, in Houston, who used to be the Data Protection Commissioner here, of course, and the Legislatiekamer. It has been criticized by the Data Protection Authorities at our meeting in Cyprus in, in April. It has been criticized by State Watch, Privacy International, by anybody who knows anything about these issues. It is terrible. I have, I've made a special little handout, uh, which I pilfered for something else that I'm writing that you're not allowed to know about yet, but I'll let you know about it when I'm finished. Um, everybody has criticized as not meeting the most basic requirements. It doesn't deal with data protection at the national level. Very serious fault, because it means that if data are sent from Germany, where you have a high level of protection, to the United Kingdom, where you have a lousy level of protection, it will basically lose its protection. Which means you're creating a loophole through which data can be circulated. The Germans send it to the UK, and the UK it goes to everybody, and then they can pick it up from everybody again. Um, it doesn't apply, worst of all things in the war against terror, to data process, processing of data relating to intelligence matters, either by the intelligence services or by the police working in cooperation with them. That is worse than, than, than a loophole, that is, as you say, it is driving a coach and horses through the whole thing. You might as well tear it up for what it was. And even if you take it on the lift, lift, limited areas where it still applies, it doesn't guarantee a high level of protection when data are sent to third countries. Read the United States. It doesn't guarantee adequate principle limitation. In other words, if the data are not going to be abused for another purpose that they weren't intended for. Uh, it doesn't adequately protect sensitive data, that is data on race, religion, sexual orientation, things like that. The thing is an absolute disgrace. I'm very happy to be quoted on it. Yeah? It's an absolute scandal that the council even dares to put something forward like that and at the same time talk about protecting human rights in the European Union. You can't have it both right. Please read the handouts on that for detail. 
So that's data transfers do not EU general uh, countries general own space in the United States if we're interested in, so let's talk about that very briefly. Um, there was an the United States after 9-11 adopted um, a law which required all airlines to pass all data on their passengers to the United States before the airline, uh, before the people would show up. Yeah, that, um, some hours in advance. They also demanded this, of course, of European airlines. Um, that clearly practically contradicts the data protection directive. This is first pillar data. Yeah, it's data collected in a commercial context by an airline or its customers. It is not passed on for the purpose for which it was collected. You give the airline the information because you want to travel with them, or maybe you, want, you tell them you want a halal meal, or a kosher meal, or whatever. Uh, you don't do that to let the Americans know what your religion is. So this definitely could not be squared with the directive. The directive allows for passing all of data to third countries, but only if the third country guarantees adequate protection. Okay, negotiations between the United States and the Commission, effectively the Council, they reached a deal. The deal was massively criticized by the Data Protection Authority, the supervisor and everybody else, especially also by Parliament, the European Parliament, who opposed it and took the case to the European Court. The European Court struck it down because it was adopted on a wrong legal basis. In other words, the Court did not address the fundamental principles by whether or not it, it uh, gave adequate protection to personal data, but it just said it was on the wrong legal basis. So I had to start all over again. They come up with a new arrangement, and hey, ho, oh, hello, oh, it is, uh, it's not maybe as bad, but it is still lousy. Instead of 34 items of data, there are only something 90 items of data. The most important pro problems with it, I can't go into detail, you can find all the detail on the State Watch website. Yeah? Especially in the analysis of a chap called Steve Pierce, P-E-E-R-S, Steve Pierce of the University of Essex. Very, very good man. He knows more about this than I will ever even begin to understand. He does all the analysis. And without him, the public in Europe would not be properly informed. Really, it takes one person to consistently go through all this ghastly, ghastly detailed stuff and show up the big pitfalls in it. Very strange agreement. The agreement consists of a formal agreement plus a set of covering letters. The covering letters, going back into my international law bit, uh, do not make clear whether they are part of the agreement. It's not clear whether they are a treaty or not. One of the strangest things is that the United States gave certain undertakings. One particular thing it did, it made the Homeland Security data subject to its own privacy laws, which was great because that's what the Data Protection Authorities had asked for just before this agreement was adopted. Then, a few weeks after the agreement was adopted, they then brought in an exemption which basically <coughs> tore up the data protection that they had just granted. Whether the Commission has two possibilities, as State Watch puts out, Ben Hayes uh, is the man who briefed me on this one. Either the Commission was in collusion with the Americans over this, or they were so ignorant as to be totally culpable of, uh, of, of not knowing what policies to adopt. It really was, again, a stab in the back of the concept of the rule of law. To give the impression that you provide protection and then to take it away with, them with the other hand a few weeks later. Those are just a few examples for the details go to the, uh, the State Law website. Just to mention that there is a massive system of data collection in, uh, in Europe. It's a worldwide system of data collection. It's based on a 1948 agreement between the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom. And it is basically a massive worldwide monitoring system of all the data that float around um, through, through satellites in particular. Uh, there are some very big systems, Menhill, well, in Mel Menhill, I think the thing is called in, in the United Kingdom, the smallest. Look at pictures. If you type in Edson, in Google, you find lots and lots of references to it. Basically, they suck up all the data that they can possibly get. I don't know if you've heard of the controversy recently in the United States about the United States authorities spying on the emails and telephone calls of United States citizens. Big controversy because it's unconstitutional. Well, the Americans have a little blind spot in their constitutional eye. 